Clinical Pelvimetry Patient Preparation The first thing we need to do is to introduce ourselves to the patient and establish rapport. Explain what procedure will be done and why is it important. Clinical pelvimetry must be assessed in order to know the dimensions of the pelvic inlet, mid-pelvis, and pelvic outlet, since these will serve as a passageway of the baby. After explaining these, ask the patient to empty her bladder and remove her undergarment. Patient Positioning Make sure to apply drapes on the patient, covering the mid-abdomen up to the knee. Ask the patient to assume the dorsal lithotomy position where she lies on her back with her legs flexed at 90 degrees at the hip. Make sure that the patient's thighs are flexed, abducted, and externally rotated. Ensure that the buttocks are at the edge of the table. It is important to know the dimensions of the hand you use for examining. The important measurements are the distance between the tip of the middle finger and the base of the thumb. The transverse diameter of your closed fist measured across the knuckles. And the combined width of your middle and index finger. The examiner should be wearing gloves when performing the examination. Additionally, using a lubricant may be necessary to minimize discomfort. The pelvis is described as having four imaginary planes. These include the plane of the pelvic inlet, also called the superior strait, plane of the pelvic outlet, or the inferior strait, plane of the mid-pelvis, the one with the least pelvic dimension, and is the most important clinically since instances of arrest or descent occur at this level, and the plane of the greatest pelvic dimension, where the fetal head rotates to the anterior position. The pelvic inlet, or the superior strait, is considered as a superior plane of the true pelvis. This is bounded by the promontory and all of the sacrum, posteriorly, by the linea terminalis, laterally, and by the horizontal pubic rami and symphysis pubis, anteriorly. Fetal head engagement during labor is defined by the fetal head's biparietal diameter passing through this plane. The pelvic inlet of females is more round than ovoid, aiding in fetal passage. The fetal head is in the transverse position upon entering this plane. The four diameters of the pelvic inlet include the anteroposterior, transverse, and two oblique diameters. The most cephalod of the anteroposterior diameters is the true conjugate, also called the anatomic conjugate. It spans from the uppermost margin of the symphysis pubis up to the sacral promontory. Next is the obstetrical conjugate, the clinically significant anteroposterior diameter. It has the shortest distance between the sacral promontory and the symphysis pubis. The obstetric conjugate represents the actual space that is available to the fetus and normally measures up to 10 cm or more. However, this cannot be examined directly using fingers. It can be calculated by subtracting 1.5 to 2 cm from the diagonal conjugate. The diagonal conjugate is then determined by measuring the distance from the lowest margin of the pubic symphysis to the sacral promontory. This usually measures up to 12.5 cm. To measure this, introduce the middle and index fingers deep into the vagina along the sacrum trying to palpate for the sacral promontory. Once this is palpated, the lowest margin of the pubic symphysis that is impinging the index finger is noted. This point up to the tip of the middle finger is considered as the diagonal conjugate. Most of the time, the tip of the middle finger 
cannot reach the sacral promontory. This still deems the diagonal conjugate as adequate. The transverse diameter is constructed at right angles to the obstetrical conjugate representing the greatest distance between the linea terminalis on either side. This usually intersects the obstetrical conjugate at a point approximately 5 cm in front of the promontory. Normally, this measures up to 13 cm but cannot be measured upon examination. The oblique diameters extend from one sacroiliac synchondrosis to the contralateral iliopubic eminence. These measure up to less than 13 cm. The mid pelvis is measured at the level of the ischial spines. The diameters of the mid pelvis are clinically important as they correspond to the narrowest diameters of the mid plane. At this level, three measurements can be made the anteroposterior diameter, the interspinous or bispinous diameters, and the posterior sagittal diameter of the mid plane. The interspinous diameter is considered significant as it is the narrowest pelvic diameter that can be measured. To measure, palpate for the prominences of the ischial spines and measure the distance between the prominences. The average measure of the bispinous diameter is 10.5 cm. The anteroposterior diameter of the mid pelvis is the distance between the inferior margin of the pubis and the junction of the fourth and fifth sacral vertebrae. The average anteroposterior diameter of the mid pelvis should measure 12 cm. The posterior sagittal diameter is measured by locating the midpoint of the interspinous diameter and connecting it to the junction of the fourth and fifth sacral vertebrae. On average, it should measure between 4.5 to 5 cm. Continue with the assessment of the pelvic midplane starting with the curvature of the sacrum. Start by assessing the curvature of the sacrum by moving your fingers down from the sacral promontory to the tip of the sacrum. Check whether its curvature is concave, flat, or convex. A concave sacrum is ideal, where flat or convex sacrum might indicate anteroposterior constriction in the mid plane. Next, determine the splay of the pelvic sidewalls in a similar fashion. Palpate whether the sidewalls are straight or parallel, convergent or divergent. This can be assessed by holding the index finger against the ischial spine and palpating is tuberosity with the thumb. If the placement of the thumb is lateral to the index finger, the sidewalls are divergent. If they are in line with each other, the sidewalls are parallel. If the thumb is medial to the index fingers, then the sidewalls are considered convergent. Lastly, assess the width of the sacrosciatic notch. This is measured by placing your index and middle finger over the sacrospinous ligament which extends from the ischial spines towards second and third segments of the sacrum. This is considered adequate when its width accommodates more than two fingers width. The pelvic outlet can be divided into two triangles, the anterior triangle and the posterior triangle. The two triangles share a common base, the line created by connecting the two ischial tuberosities. This line also corresponds to the transverse or bituberous diameter of the pelvic outlet. The anterior triangle can be drawn from the inferior border of the pubis and the two ischial tuberosities. Likewise, the posterior triangle can be measured from the sacrococcygeal joint connecting to the two ischial tuberosities. Four diameters can be measured in the pelvic outlet. The anatomic anteroposterior diameter, the obstetric anteroposterior diameter, 
the transverse or pituberous diameter and the posterior sagittal diameter. The anatomic anteroposterior diameter is the distance between the inferior margin of the pubis and the tip of the coccyx. On average, the anatomic AP diameter measures 9.5 cm. The obstetric anteroposterior diameter is measured from the inferior margin of the pubis to the sacrococcygeal joint at the midline. The average measure for the obstetric AP diameter is 11.5 cm. To obtain this measurement, insert two fingers into the vagina. The tips of the fingers is placed at the tip of the sacrum or at the sacrococcygeal joint. The other hand of the examiner marks where the hand contacts the symphysis pubis. The distance between the tip of the fingers and the point of contact with the symphysis pubis is measured as the obstetric anteroposterior diameter. The transverse or bituberous diameter is measured as the distance between the inner surface of the ischial tuberosities. The transverse or bituberous diameter usually measures 11 cm, but a measurement of 8.5 cm is considered adequate. To measure, the examiner palpates for the ischial tuberosities and uses his or her fist to measure the point of contact. The distance between the point of contact is measured as the transverse diameter. To measure the posterior sagittal diameter, first, draw an imaginary line along the transverse diameter of the pelvic outlet. Approximate the center of this imaginary line and connect it to the sacrococcygeal joint. The distance between the sacrococcygeal joint and the center line between the ischial tuberosities approximates the posterior sagittal diameter. The average measurement for this is 7.5 cm and measurements above 8 cm are considered adequate for the pelvic outlet. To assess the subpubic angle, place the thumb next to each inferior pubic remus, estimating the angle at which they meet. Normally, this angle accommodates two fingers, indicating at least 90 degrees. Less than 90 degrees indicates a contracted transverse diameter of the mid-pelvis and pelvic outlet. At the end of the examination, let the patient know what her findings are. Explain the normal values and their implications. For the pelvic inlet, the obstetrical conjugate must be at least 10 cm. When the sacral promontory is not palpated, it is indicative of an adequate space. For the mid-pelvis, sacrum must be curved, by ischial spines must not be prominent, and must not have convergent sidewalls. By spinous diameter should be at least 9.5 cm. The sacrosciatic notch is considered adequate when the sacrospinous ligament measures 2.5 fingers. For the pelvic outlet, the distance between the two ischial tuberosities must be at least 8.5 cm. The subpubic angle must admit two fingers, indicating 90 degrees. The mobility of the coccyx may be determined externally while pressing firmly on it. The AP diameter of the pelvic outlet must be at least 11 cm. Once you are done explaining, Assist the patient into a comfortable position, thanking her afterwards. And that would be all. Thank you.